John 7, 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood crying, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, and he that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly or his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. But Jesus has been glorified, the Spirit has been given, and today, thank God, we can not only enjoy being born again, but we can enjoy the wonderful Spirit-filled and Spirit-led life. You know, this has always been a very strategic thing to me, to see people coming out of church with that blank stare on their face. Why did we even go? They had been in a religious convention that promised to change their life, but no one's life had been changed because there was no life there. And coming out of a religious convention, Jesus literally stands and at the top of his voice, he said, if any man thirst, is anyone thirsty? You've been to church all week, you've been to conference, you've been to convention, you've been to something that promised to change your life, but you look blank. Is anybody thirsty? Come unto me. Come unto me. And that's still the answer. I can't improve on it. If any man's thirsty, that's exactly what Jesus was crying out here in this seventh chapter of John. If, you're, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. You've got to come and you've got to drink. If you'll come and if you'll drink, and if you'll believe, you must come, you must drink, you must believe. It's more than just going to church. It's more than just hearing a beautiful number by the choir. There's more than just say, well, I know I'm in a place where good things are happening, but uh, excuse me, you don't understand. I'm out of here. It takes time to receive from God. So you've got to be thirsty. You've got to come unto Jesus. You must believe on him when you do come according to the scriptures. And out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water, the powerful, life-giving, blessed, Holy Spirit of God. You know, the Bible tells us that in Revelation, I don't have time to go there, but it says there's a, there's a river there. It's a crystal clear. No pollution. Perfect, and it's where we're going. With that in mind, let's turn back to Psalms 46. Here in the 46th division of the Psalms, it said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah, or think about this, meditate on this. There is a river. In the midst of mountains being moved and the seas roaring and someone, I've heard it several times this week, what's wrong? The weather is so unpredictable and catastrophes and things happening. In the midst of all of it, hear the voice of God. There is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. What's so special about this river? Well, the whole chapter is full of it, but verse 5 said God's in the midst of this river. God is in the midst of this river. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. The heathen raids, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. Folks, do you understand? One word from God can turn it around. Let the lightning flash. Let the thunders roll. Let kingdoms do their thing. One word from God can stop the thing in its tracks. We have an awesome God. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. 
He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. And then verses 10 and 11, still reading in Psalms 46. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. What a promise. Be still and know that I am God. Don't let the news ruin your day. God said, I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Meditate on that. It'll change your life. You know, I guess one of the kindest things said about any move of God is that many are calling what God is doing across America and around the world, many are reverently calling it the river. Are you in the river? Songs about the river, messages about the river. You hear believers talking about the river. I'm hearing some unusual people I never thought would talk like that, talking about the river. There is a river of revival, renewing and refreshing in the land today. And what does this river of revival mean to you personally? I just want to ask you from a pastor's heart. Maybe you're new here today and you really don't know you say, I don't understand why these people are so loud. Do they have to be so loud? Well, we're getting you ready for heaven. Does it have to be so long? No. But probably because it's so short during the week, the time we give to God, we need some extra time. Folks, we need some overtime in the house of God. I don't know much about it. It's very fascinating that all these grown men are chasing a little puck across the ice. Really, I've almost come to believe and even looking at what little I've seen of it, I think they're probably some of the most superbly in shape athletes anywhere today. They certainly work for a living, that's for sure. They work harder and make less than a lot of other sports personalities I know. On the radio the other night, I thought, well, I'm interested in who's going to win this game. So I tuned in and they said, it's an overtime. And boy, everybody was fired up. Now, when the buzzer rang, do you think the stars and the avalanche would just walk away from that puck and say, well, the buzzer rang. A lot of believers would, but not hockey players. <laughs> I've seen believers walk away from a red hot service and, and they were headed for the second overtime when unfortunately the wrong team hit the hockey puck and we lost. They were headed for the second overtime. They said the fans were standing up in the seats. They were fans, fanatics. They were fans. They were fanatics. I remember my father's uh, roommate in Baylor Law School, and he was quite a baseball. He was a baseball fanatic. In fact, if there wasn't a previous couldn't get out of commitment, he would leave his office downtown and go straight to the ballpark. I mean, tie, suit, shirt, and all. Probably the tie would come off by the time he got there. And he'd go straight from the office and stay there until the ball game was over and then come home and do it all over again, go to work the next morning. Now, do you know why Mr. Hill did that? Because he was a fan. Fanatic. He was a fanatic. He loved baseball. He said it helped him to unwind. It helped him to relax from all the things that he dealt with in his law practice. He said, it's my outlet. Man, I tell you, coming in from a week of all the things that some of you face and get to lift up holy hands without wrath and praise God and worship God and give unto God and meet other people who have been through it too, but after all they've been through and after all you've been through, here we are on Sunday morning. We're fans, fanatics. We're fans, we're fanatics. Don't you like fanatics? And someone bought me some tickets and I saw the first Indy race out at the, probably about two years ago. Man, that's the most fascinating thing. It's nothing like television. You know, on television, you just hypnotize you almost in those cars doing all the things. That man, when you're up there watching those guys come by 200 miles an hour, man, shh, it's a rush, I mean, you know. Going, and I mean, they're right on, I mean, just like our freeways, except they're 200 miles an hour, you know. 
<laughs> They're right on each other's bumper, man. And I thought, well, that man hit that man by accident. The guy said he hit him by accident. He hit him on purpose. Fanatics. Tear your race car up, get another one, get back on the track the next meet. Some crazy thing happened, you don't quit. You know the man that won out here at Colonial Golf Course? The man played 15 years before he won any major golf trophy. Played 15 years. Can you imagine the money that that man spent flying, traveling, playing, all the hotels and all the fees? And if you'd have walked up to him on the 14th year, said, buddy, are you gonna quit? Nah, he said, there's a prize out there somewhere. Young fanatics just said, we're going back because someday we believe we're gonna win it. Someday we believe we're gonna win it. You know, there's something in the heart of a fanatic every time they come to church, they believe they're going to receive something. Every time they come to church, they believe somebody's gonna get saved. Every time they come to church, they believe someone's gonna get their breakthrough and break out. I feel so sorry for folks that just bop into church, you know, and count the lights and the ceiling and, you know, wear your Timex out. And go home. Listen, there's life in this place today. Jesus is in the house. The angels of God are in this house today. I love Psalms 46. I like chapters. Whenever possible, I like just get a chapter and just go through it. There is a river. Are you in the river? Is it worth the effort to be in the river? To be in the river means you have to spend more time in church, longer services, second offerings. Are you in the river? Have you ever been in the river? Oh, yes, Brother Nichols, in 1993, I got in the river. Honey, you're stone dry right now. There's not a drop of water on your toe at this point. Are you in the river? Do you want to be in the river? Are you willing to pay the price to be in the river? That's what it's all about. We used to have a swimming hole. That we called it a river. It really wasn't much of a river. But, you know, when you're young, <laughs> things look big anyway. You follow the railroad tracks down toward Crowley. I, I haven't even tried to find it in years and years, but it, it used to be we'd ride our bicycles and we'd get off the beaten path and, boy, we had a swimming hole down there. We called it the river. Probably just a little old drippy creek is what it was, you know, but you could get about this deep in it, you know, and we really thought that was something else. And I remember that's the coldest water I ever got in in my life. And I remember we'd get down there and, you know, big old boys, you know, we'd putting our toes out there, putting our toe in there. And then finally someone just push you in. <laughs> I can't explain it. The best way to get in the river is just dive in, jump in. You say, what kind of river is it? Well, it said God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The river is a river of refuge. The word refuge means shelter and protection. You know, let me tell you something. When you just get wrapped up in Jesus and Jesus becomes, you become absorbed in Jesus. You become a Jesus fanatic. The river becomes a place of refuge. It's a place of shelter. Oh, that those precious people that lost their lives in Oklahoma and other places in the tornadoes could have been in the shelter. It would have been a place of protection. Hey, they believe in shelters in Oklahoma. <laughs> when there's a cloud or when there's a warning or when the siren goes off, uh, they don't play games because they found if you're in the place of refuge, you may lose everything you've got, but you're still alive. You can start again if there's still life, you see. When you get into the river, it's a river of refuge. I can't explain it, but I come to church and I feel this shelter, sheltered in the arms of God, the protection of God Almighty. It's a river of refuge. This is a river of strength. The Lord is our refuge and strength. 
You know, I feel sorry for folks, these self-made folks that don't need anybody or anything. Let me tell you something. I need every ounce of strength God Almighty can give me. In fact, one sign of the end time, according to Daniel, is a need for strength. Daniel said, I had a revelation. I had a vision of the end time and I fainted. Daniel said, I just couldn't handle it. And a hand touched me and revived me and put me back on my feet again. That's why so many people are falling out along the way. They need that hand to touch them, to strengthen them, to put that life of God back in them. I tell you, life will suck every ounce of strength you have out of you. That's why David said in Psalms 27, the Lord is the strength of my life. Sign of the end time is a need for strength. According to the Ephesian letter and many other portions of God's word, there is supernatural strength in our God. Oh, this river is a river of help in times of trouble. I feel so sorry for people that really don't have a body of believers to go to when the bottom falls out or when things happen in their life. It's so comforting through the years, the various things that all of us face just to come to church and know that you're elbow to elbow with real people that know how to pray and stand with you and they'll hold your hands up and they'll encourage you. A very present help in the time of trouble. When you're in the river, you just know you're in a place of shelter, a place of protection, a place of help, and a place of strength. The Lord is my help. The Lord is my helper. It's a river that will give you freedom from fear. I didn't say that it's a guarantee. You've got to believe it. This river of God will set you free. I've seen in these intense times of meetings, I mean, people just don't care about anything. It's not that they're, they're irresponsible, but that beats having a nervous breakdown. That means just coming apart and nothing being right in your life. I mean, people coming in and say, Pastor, I'm, I'm facing some of the most difficult things in my life, but it's going to be all right. God's with us. Woo, hallelujah. Just couldn't wait to get back in. Be in the presence of God and His presence is fullness of joy at His right hand are pleasures forevermore. This thing will set you free from fear. David said, I sought the Lord and He heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. You having a fear problem? Get in the river. Something else The fifth thing that I noticed here from Psalms 46, there are many streams to this river. Many streams to this river. Many streams that contribute to this river. If there's anything I've learned since God poured out of His Spirit in those early days of 1993 in the month of June, I thank God for the river that I've been able to swim in in Fort Worth. I thank God for the river down in Pensacola. I thank God for the river in Canada. I thank God for the river in Toronto. Thank God for the river up in Saskatoon. Hey, we have a sister church up there that is red hot on fire for God. I mean, they're blowing the back doors off with Holy Ghost revival in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And they were doing that 50 below zero before the summer ever got here. Let me tell you, I thank God for rivers. There's rivers that are flowing in the United Kingdom. There's rivers that are flowing in Australia. There's rivers that are flowing in South Africa. Oh, people are hungering after God all over the world. Many streams, but there's one river, and that's the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Many streams, but one river. How majestic is that phrase, there is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. Now, let me tell you something about swimming in this river. I remember we'd dive into that little, our great lake we called our, our great river, you know. Man, we were yelling and hollering and we had all kind of things going on. You know, we just, we didn't know the first and 15th existed. We were kids riding our bicycle, you know, just looking for some action. But let me tell you about this river. This, this river is a place of gladness and joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of a sporting event, it's it's okay, it's a stimulant. We all enjoy those things for a few moments or a few hours or whatever. But I want you to know this river's a river of gladness and joy. This river flows at three o'clock in the morning. This river flows when there's pain in your body. This river flows when you get bad news and you don't know how to respond to it. This river is real. It's a river of joy. It's a river of gladness. What's wrong with gladness and joy? If you looked at the face of the average believer, we'd 
We need an avalanche of gladness and joy. Life is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Pastor down in uh, New Orleans, they called him the most sober minister in Louisiana. This man had never been known to have been caught in a smile. It wasn't that he was such a negative person. He just, he just straight faced, never known to smile, never known to smile. In fact, uh, there was church trouble that came up and, and people left. And then another deal of church trouble came up. And I mean, it was just one thing after another. But you know, a, a strange thing began to happen. In fact, I was, I was in a service the night here in Texas when that minister said, I've come to the end of myself. You know, that's a good place to be. Most folks aren't to the end of themselves. They haven't really come to the point where they're desperate for a change. When you get desperate for a change, God will change you. And that dear man, I saw God absolutely. I don't know when I've seen God work on a man like God worked on that man. God in one night totally turned that pastor completely around, did a 180. And that pastor went back with his staff to Louisiana and people started coming back to that church because they heard that he was smiling. It wasn't a mean person. It wasn't that at all. But, but by his own admission, he said, I had no joy. I had no gladness. The ministry had become boring. And people came back just to see the pastor smile. He's actually smiling on the platform. He's actually smiling in the pulpit. Interesting, isn't it? Thank God this is river of gladness and joy. I saw someone smile the other day that I've never seen smile. And I thought, isn't that wonderful? I've never seen that person really, you know, I saw what I thought was the beginning of a little smirk, but I never saw, never saw a smile. It's wonderful to see a person smile that you've never seen smile. It takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. We discovered that up in Mayo Clinic and, and all over. In fact, I heard Dr. Schambach preach a message about uh, joy and healing and up in Mayo Clinic, they've discovered that happy people heal faster. Sad people go down, lose life, lose their vision, their desire to even live. And so they'd have them watch little silly movies like Laurel and Hardy and Keystone Cops and, you know, just slapstick stuff. And after a while, they'd get to laughing at that silly stuff and something about it releases those little endorphins inside of you that you've been sitting on for so long and some of you want to smile so bad but you're holding on to that seat with both hands. That preacher is not going to get me to break loose and smile. You might get a healing if you just, just smile. It's a river of gladness and joy. Did you ever notice teenagers trying to be cool? They don't smile. They'll pull up to a traffic light. It's been a new world in a sport utility vehicle. It's, it's really interesting. I'm taller than they are now. <laughs> I kind of look. Yeah. You got to look cool. You can't smile. Oh, that sounds like the devil to me. God wants you to enjoy the journey. God wants you to enjoy the journey. People coming back, and that church is just red hot going on and in the fires of revival because the pastor started smiling. And they heard a rumor that it was true, but they came back to check it out. No, no, that pastor could not be smiling. People coming to church because they heard the pastor smiling. That, that's interesting. It's a river of gladness and joy. I'll tell you something about the river of revival. It's, it's a holy place. Some people have been very critical of that, but it's a holy place. You know, no matter how hilarious things get around church, it's still holy. The presence of God. You know, isn't it something that people can cry in church and be happier than the world is when they're putting on a forced laugh? Of course, that's something else we've discovered in revival. Forced joy is better than genuine depression. But it's a holy place. I've seen in this church the gamut of emotions run. Here's someone weeping convulsively, weeping out heaviness and 
abuse and things that have backed up for a lifetime. How many people have told me they could point out the place on the carpet. I wept until it seemed there were no more tears and when I got up, I was cleansed, I was healed, I was set free. And here's somebody else over here just laughing their head off. And yet God is in the midst of it. It's a holy place. Maybe I could say it like this. Whatever God does for you is holy. If God saved your grandchild today, that would be holy for you, wouldn't it? If God healed your wife or your husband or someone, if you saw God heal someone, that would be a, an act of holy on the part of God. Joe and I were downtown, uh, almost, I guess this Wednesday night be a couple of Wednesday nights, and we've been blessed some tickets to Bass Hall and see one of our precious young ladies play her violin there, and all those young people did a fantastic job, just high school young people and just such talent. We just took a little stroll down, I believe it was Houston Street, and we thought we'd go in and get a cup of coffee there in a little coffee house. It happens everywhere I go, and I don't mean to ignore anybody, but you know, when someone calls my name, you don't stand up and say, that's me, that's me. <laughs> you know, you, you, you smile and try to see, you think you know where it's coming from, and wave at somebody and go on, uh, unless they're there to talk to. But someone on the sidewalk said, Pastor Nichols, and I really couldn't see who it was. I thought I had, and I just, just waved and went on inside. Well, we were inside for a while, sitting there, and after a while, a young man came up to the little table where we were sitting, and uh, he just kind of knelt down there by the table and introduced himself. He said, you know, I don't remember how long ago it was when Robert Kanja was preaching here, but that young man was hooked on heroin. And Robert Kanji gave him a $5 bill. I remember he gave a young man a five, you know, so many things happen around here. It's hard to keep up with everything. But that young man came and gave his heart to the Lord. And God set him free. I believe he's approaching 18 months of being clean. He said, he said I've been completely set free from heroin. <laughs> completely set free from heroin. And he said, I, I come downtown every night and just witness. He said, I, he said it's, a, it's a wonderful ministry, just kind of in a quiet, soft cell. And he said, I preach when I get the chance. But he said, God's changed my life, and God gave me a good Christian girl. And he said, I'm married now. And he said, he said I just want to thank you, Pastor Nichols. God completely turned my life around in Calvary Cathedral. God could have done it anywhere, but thank God it happened. And it's some of the fruit of your tithe and your offerings unto the Lord. You say you're bragging on the church, no, I'm bragging on Jesus. It's a river, it's a holy place. Joe and I went home, we shared that one of our caregivers with Janet, and boy, it touched her heart. As Joe and I were driving home, we said, you know, that's what the ministry's all about. You don't see all the results. You say, do you know all that's happening around here? Dear God, no. I just show up for work <laughs> and worship like you do. There are so many miracles that have come. Spin-offs from singles, from power tower, from stitches, from youth, from, you know, and on and on. From the bookstore. I get testimonies from the bookstore, from the radio broadcast. Uh, we've had several of those that have come just recently saying, that a broadcast just totally changed my life. I mean, that still amazes me. Just to think the power of the gospel of Christ. And then to think of these meetings when people bring in people from sometimes 100 or 200 miles away because they hear that there will be an altar call and they bring people here. No, not everybody stays at Calvary. It would be nice, I guess, if they did, if that's what God wanted. But you know, the main thing we've got to do is be ready to respond when people need to come to Jesus. Thank God it's a holy place where people can give their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. Joy is a very good judge of character. When we looked in that young man's face, it was just so sincere. I mean, there was no big story. He wasn't trying to snow anybody. He just was so thankful that God had changed his life. You know, God is in the midst of this river. God is in the midst of this river. God is in the midst of this river. Sometimes people try to identify a river with a man, but hey, it's the man, Christ Jesus. And then those truly touched by this river are not easily swayed and moved. 
I'm going to tell you folks, we've got to get a hold of something. The end time is on us. We've got to stop playing games with church. We've got to come here for the right purposes. If nobody shakes my hand, if someone says something tacky to me, I didn't come for you. I came to worship Jesus. <laughs> Satan will see that somebody does some sensical, nonsensical thing that just flips your switch the wrong way at the very moment when God was getting ready to break through with a truth or a scripture or a verse from the word of God. But as I look at this from God's word, those that are in the river, I want you to say it with me. Those that are truly touched by this river, this river of revival, are not easily swayed and they're not easily moved. They're established in the Word of God. If we're really in Christ, if we're really in the river, we don't let circumstances and things just push us and push us. And There's always going to be something around church. Church is the easiest place in the world to get offended, believe me. And you know who's behind that? Who's on, you know who's over that committee? Lucy himself, alias Lucifer. Hey, when I go to conventions, I go through the same thing. Here you've driven hundreds of miles and you're gonna let some misguided individual sit next to you steal what God's trying to do for you. That doesn't make sense. Those that are truly touched by this river are not easily swayed or moved. They're established by faith in the word of God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And you know, the word of God goes on to say this in verse 10 of Psalms 46. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Listen to me. Be still and know. You don't get to know God running. You don't get to know God over a quick cup of coffee and pull a promise out of a promise box. Relationships spell T-I-M-E, time. It's a river of knowing God for yourself. I'm glad that you know God, but your knowing God doesn't help me to know God. I must know God for myself. Knowing God for yourself, it's so important. Be still and know that I am God. Well, Brother Nichols, I listen to tapes while I'm driving on the freeway. That's wonderful, but you need an undisturbed, if it's 15 minutes a day, if it's 20 minutes a day, phone off the hook, television off, radio off, a quiet time where you can listen to God. Be still and know that I am God. It's just like the batteries on your little cell phone if you have one. Those batteries can run down until your signal becomes weak and your signal just goes off. And so you put it on the battery charger. You don't charge it in two minutes, one minute, five minutes. You may have a quick one that charges, but you got to leave it there for a few quality minutes. And after a while, you pick the phone up and now the signal comes through loud and clear. Folks, the same thing is true about the kingdom of God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. It's the great exchange. It means if, as if I would take my coat off and put it on Say Mark here, for instance, there's the exchange of putting my coat on him. And he would hand me his coat and I would try to get it on. <laughs> it's the great exchange. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see... It's a river of knowing God for yourself. But let me give you the last truth that I see here in Psalms 46. When you're really in the river, it's just wonderful. In verse 7 and verse 11, it said, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Don't read that too quickly. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Notice that. 
Right after, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. And now it concludes with verse 11, which is a continuance of verse 7 in Psalms 46. The Lord of hosts is with us. Do you know what that Lord of hosts means? It means when you're in that river of the Lord of hosts, host is like a multitude you can't count. It's like a swarm of locusts. It's like a, a number. God could number it, but I mean, you just look out and all you see this humongous cloud of people or soldiers or war machines. It's a host too big to number, bigger than you are, but it's also bigger than your problem is. Unlimited resources, unlimited protection. We talked about protection in the beginning of Psalms 46. We were talking about the offensive, but oh, let me tell you, when you cast your burden on the Lord, he gets on the defense in your behalf. There's got to be offense, but there's got to be defense. When the Lord of hosts begins to fight your battles, your enemy's in a world of hurt. Your enemy's in a world of hurt. The Lord of hosts means that God's bigger than your problems. God's bigger than your challenges. God's bigger than the lies of the enemy. God's bigger than anyone. God's bigger than anything. God's bigger. What does it mean, the Lord of hosts? I mean, Philistines, bring out all your armies and all the armies of all the ites in the Old Testament. And now watch God bring out the Lord of hosts. He is the, the general of a host of angelic messengers that you cannot count. He's got more chariots than you can count. He's got more war machines than you can count. He has more drawn flaming swords than you can count. God is bigger than anything or anyone. He's the Lord of hosts. My God, we all feel overwhelmed sometimes. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? You don't know what to do. You don't know which way to turn. But the Lord of hosts is with us. He's the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of hosts. Bigger than anything, bigger than anyone, he is the, the, the Lord of hosts. And he's bigger than the White House, he's bigger than your house. He's bigger than wars and rumors of wars. He's bigger, he's greater, he's more powerful. How great is our God. I'm just trying to just serve you up line upon line and precept upon precept. You remember the prophet of God? When his associate came in, he hadn't been on the staff of Calvary very long. And he heard one of those war stories and he came and said, Pastor Nichols, they're everywhere, but they're going the wrong way. Chariots and horses and the opposition is there. Pastor Nichols, don't you understand? I think I better go home to mama. We're all in trouble, don't you understand? Let me play the prophet of God for a moment. And I said, oh God, open the young man's eyes. He hasn't been through some of the things we've been through. So Lord, open his eyes. And he blinks and he looks out and he said, Pastor, excuse me, I didn't see the right thing there. They with, that be with us are greater than they that be with them. Nothing Satan can bring out is bigger than the God, the Lord of hosts that is with us. It's not how many of them, it's how many are for us. That's what it's all about. Hey, every week, I mean, I've got my stack of impossible things that people have presented to me. Problems with children, grandchildren, jobs, personality conflicts, relationships that are strained. All, I mean, every week, all of our staff, our portfolio and counseling and so on, our portfolios are full. But you know what? We could lay every one of those impossibilities at the feet of the Lord Jesus and trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not to our own understanding. And you open your eyes, but it still hasn't changed. In all of our ways, acknowledge Him. 
Yada him, know him and make him known, and he shall direct your paths. God can change a child, a grandchild, a man or a woman. God can change anybody. The Lord of hosts is with us. Get a hold of that. They that be with us. 